Thank you very much for tuning in today. To uh, We're going to be talking about methane, uh, specifically Canada's role in methane abatement and how that fits in with the, um, with the global uh, fight against methane emissions. Uh, my name is Dale Marshall. I'm National Climate Program Manager with Environmental Defense Canada. So I um, help to run the federal program on climate change um, for environmental defense. Um, and I have with me Carol Moffitt, who's President and CEO of the Center for International Environmental Law. Thanks a lot for joining. Thanks for having me. Um, so maybe we can start with a more general question, uh, which is to tell me a little bit more about what happened last week with respect to the Global Methane Pledge and why the world attacking methane emissions is an, an important initiative. Yeah. Um, last week we saw the announcement of a global methane pledge that includes a commitment by uh, about 100 countries to reduce their emissions of methane by 30 percent by 2030. Um, the reason cutting methane emissions is critically important is because methane is a, is a much more powerful climate forcer than CO2. Methane is on an, on a, on a, on a 20 year time frame, 85, 84 times more powerful a climate forcer than CO2. And what we're racing against right now is time. So to the extent that we can cut emissions now and rapidly, it will help us control the rapid rise of temperatures. Methane is only a part of the solution. We have to cut CO2 as well, um, but moving rapidly on both of them together can get us farther faster. And so the pledge that uh, over 100 countries made was to reductions of 30% uh, by 2030. And that number seems low because, you know, I've been operating in Canada, you're in the US, uh, you know, we've had pledges of 40 to 45% and, and, um, and then 75% by 2030. Um, but that includes more global, more sources of methane emissions, right? Is that, is, is that, how do you feel about the 30%? Do you feel like that's an ambitious target because it encompasses more methane or should, or, or, sh or should we be going further than that? It is a starting point, uh, but we do have to go further and we have to go further faster even by 2030. I think part of the challenge with, with methane is that you've got three major sources of methane. You've got, so you've got uh, emissions from the oil and gas sector, you know, both upstream and through the distribution systems. Mm. Then, you've got, then you've got emissions from the agricultural sector, methane emissions from livestock, particularly cattle, which are, are very challenging to address. Um, and then you have emissions from landfill waste, um, which can be captured um, in some circumstances, but that is a very diffuse emission stream scattered across much of the planet. And so I think that the challenge with methane is you've got those very distinct sources of the problem, and that means those sources that we can move quickly on, those sources that we can control most readily, need to go farther, faster. And so in terms of both Canada and the U.S., Canada has recently announced that it a new target for 2030 just for oil and gas, which is a 75% reduction uh, by 2030, at least 75% reduction. Um, the US came forward more recently saying here are a number of things that they're going to be doing and they, they, their modeling shows them they can get to 74% reductions by 2030. What do you think of those pledges? Well, I think the first and fundamental question is 75% of what? What are you setting your baseline against? And this is really critically important in the context of methane. The story of, the for, story of methane emissions and the estimation of methane emissions for the last few decades has been consistently that they are underestimated over and over again. And even as recently as this year, we're seeing that methane emissions from some countries and some sectors may be 50% or more higher than, than is, is widely assumed. And so that 75% that emissions cut, the critical question is 75% against what you thought the emissions were in 2012, what you thought they were last year, or what they really will be as we begin to understand all the sources of emissions. Right. Um, I would, I mean, I would maybe add to that, uh, you know, countries like Canada and the U.S., right, when we talk about common differentiated responsibility, rich countries like ours should be probably moving faster um, on, that kind of a, uh, on that kind of pledge. 
the science seems to be showing that globally we can get to 75% reductions um, at, in some cases at no cost or low cost. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the thinking within a lot of Canadian environmental groups is that Canada and U.S. can actually get there either faster or go further by 2030. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's exactly right. I think both of these countries have the resources and the responsibility and the legacy of emissions that, you know, that means they should be taking the lead. They should go much farther, much faster. If we're going to get the entire world um, reducing methane emissions in a way that will keep us, you know, will keep us on track to stay below 1.5 degrees, those countries with the resources and equipment to go farther, faster, really need to be doing that. And so I think 75% emissions cuts really should be seen as an ambitious floor, but just a floor, um, and needs to be ramped up you know, really dramatically. And I'll note that one of the most effective ways to ramp up those emission cuts is to stop expanding the production of the fossil fuels that both drive the climate crisis and are a major source of methane emissions in both countries. Right, well on that point, um, Canada last year, the Environment and Climate Change Canada actually came out with its numbers for what uh, Canada would be on track to by 2025. So it's, you know, tracking pledges is important, but getting action, right? And re meeting those pledges is just as important, maybe even more so. And Canada doesn't have a good record, a <laughs> track record on, on meeting um, its, its emission reduction pledges. Anyhow, this, the data that came out of um, Climate Change Canada was showed that basically the emission reductions that were expected is would be 29% by 2025 as opposed to the 40 to 45% pledge that we that the Canadian government made um, back in 2018 so what i mean I, what would you suggest you talked about production cuts are there like what would you suggest generally and more specifically in terms of what Canada could do to actually get back on track yeah, and I think it's really important to step back and understand that the gap between that 29% and 40% when you're talking about methane and when you take into account what we don't know about, mission, um, about emissions, that is a really significant gap. Mm. And so there is, a, there is a lot that needs to be closed. And I think one of the fastest, one of the most effective ways to start closing that gap is to start taking a hard look at fossil fuel production and its role in methane emissions mm. and you know move from move from stopping expansion to actually reducing production of of oil and gas which are not only fueling the climate crisis as a whole but are you know the most significant contributors in North America to methane emissions overall and would you think you know I totally see what you're saying in terms of production cuts um, coming so that we're not continuing to expand an industry that is that is the biggest already the biggest um, greenhouse gas polluter in Canada. Are there are there regulations that can be also introduced at the same time to go further than than um, in terms of actually reducing emissions in facilities that are existing? Yeah, and I think the you know what we see in the regulations is an early focus on increased testing and monitoring, and you know the technologies exist to seal these, to seal pipelines, to seal leaks, and that is certainly a start. That is certainly you know that is something that is well within the capacity of both countries to accelerate dramatically. But there are also really significant gains to be made in in increased monitoring, in more active use of lidar to actually trace the sources of emissions on a regular basis if you look at Canada's plans Canada's plans even now are to inspect facilities you know three times a year um, that is not particularly frequent when you look at how much even a mo modest amount of methane is going to contribute to the climate crisis I think in addition to that I think it's really important to look at the role of uh, abandoned and orf orphaned oil and gas wells. Mm. This is a problem in both Canada and the United States. The United States has estimated between 4 million and 10 million oil and gas wells. Um, Canada has hundreds of thousands, but the true number is not really known. What we do know is all of those wells continue to release methane on an ongoing basis. And so I think one of the 
one of the real opportunities for rapid action is to more aggressively be shutting in those abandoned wells and critically identifying the wells that have been lost mm. and holding producers accountable for those shut-in costs, for the environmental impacts, um, and, and for the legacy of pollution that oil and gas has created. Yeah, I mean, you talked before about um, the, the under-reporting of emissions, and in the Canadian context, it's very much the same. It doesn't matter what, you know, lots of academic studies, it doesn't matter what the methodology was, or what the facility was, or which region it was in. Um, all of them found very consistently that methane emissions were being under-reported. Uh, you know, and like you said, at 50% to 100% underreporting. So the fact that methane emissions could be up to double what they are, what what is being in what is in Canada's national inventory is problematic. Um, I imagine there are ways, though, to like to move away from just uh, modeling uh, emissions intensity per equipment and, and actually doing more of the measurements that to, so that we can true up. Um, our inventories and reflect more what the emissions actually are? Sorry, can you ask that again? Yeah, I was, I, uh, in terms of adjusting the inventory so that it does reflect reality, it does reflect actual emissions, I imagine that this research that you talked about, LIDAR, can, can be used rather than just models to estimate what the emissions might be. Because when, when you actually measure them directly, they, seem to, they tend to be higher. Yeah, and I think one of the things to understand about the challenges with methane historically is you're talking about an invisible gas. Um, a facility can be spewing methane on an ongoing basis and it's absolutely invisible to the, to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. It's only when you have the right, the right scanning equipment that you can see it there, but when you put that equipment in place, the emissions become really clear and, and the intensity of those emissions can be measured. Yeah. I think one of the other things to really recognize with methane, however, is that it's leaking not only from the fills, it is leaking from every aspect of the, of the refining and distribution system, from compressor stations, from pipelines, from distribution lines. Mm. And, so, and so addressing those upstream emissions aggressively is absolutely a, an essential beginning. But this brings us back again and again to the fact that ultimately the solution to the methane crisis is the same as the solution to the oil and gas crisis, which is to keep that oil and gas in the ground. Mm. Great. The questions at this point? Um, I think there's a microphone that um, maybe you can pass around. This lady here. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, really interesting event. My name is Maria Elvilella. I work with Zero Waste Europe and Gaia, Global Alliance for Incinerated Alternatives. So, um, yeah, so our field of work is waste management and we share the concern with, uh, about the methane emissions from landfills. Um, I just wanted to add as well that, yeah, the IPCC recognized that the waste management is one, of the, is one of the sectors with the greatest potential to reduce emissions in the next 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that's very much about tackling the methane emissions from landfills. And, you know, the thing with landfills is that the methane emissions come from the organic waste that are in there. Yeah. So the key solution is not to put the organic waste <laughs> in the first place. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, we have to deal with the historic landfills. We have to capture that gas and all of that. We basically need to invest as well in making sure that there's no organic waste going to landfills and the landfill itself is a solution of the past that doesn't have a place mm. in, a, in this future. So. Yeah, just to, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more mm. on the potential that we have in the waste management, the action that we need to see with landfills and, and this kind of policies. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. And if I could just say, I think that's a really important and valuable solution. And one of the things that makes it possible to compost organic waste is dealing with other things that are contaminating that waste and making it more difficult to manage, like you know, the, the barrage of single-use disposable plastics that, that make waste management more challenging, both for organic wastes and for recyclables. Um, you know, and I, I think that it is, as you, as you work on the plastics crisis, as you work on the issues of methane, as you work on the climate crisis, you begin to recognize how much these challenges are, are interlinked in really fundamental ways, and the solutions to them are interlinked as well. Great.
Um, is there, are there anyone else that may have a question? Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, so my, uh, I'm from the Vegan Society, um, and um, obviously we spoke a lot about oil and gas, which is obviously absolutely crucial, um, but um, not much about livestock, um, and I think the, the uh, Global Methane Pledge as well um, sort of distances itself from livestock by talking about high emission sources rather than the more generalized uh, kind of emissions from, from the livestock sector. So, um, yeah, I just wondered if, um, if we're kind of missing an opportunity to uh, engage the public in things that they can do to, to reduce global emissions um, and just, yeah, what your thoughts on, on that was. Do you want to start with that one? Um, I mean, I, I don't, I've, I, have, I have followed oil and gas methane much more than, than other sources of methane, like livestock or, or landfills. Um, it certainly was a disappointment amongst uh, many of my colleagues that there wasn't more of an emphasis on things like food waste and on, um, and on dietary choices. Um, and the livestock issue was sidelined to a certain extent in that Global Methane Pledge. I don't have any thoughts beyond that. I don't know if you can add some, Carol. No, I, I, think, that, I think it is a really important question. And I think when you look at, at livestock issues here again, we see you know, critical sources of methane emissions going unaddressed. You know, nowhere is it clearer than in, you know, with, with, in the case of concentrating, concentrated animal feeding operations. Here is a place where, where the U.S., where Canada, where other countries could make real and meaningful and rapid progress on, on um, issues of, of methane emissions even while benefiting the, the local environments by reducing the, 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 the pollution from those facilities. So there are ways to make progress on multiple fronts by, by you know, aggressive and reasonable regulatory action to address what we know are high polluting, high, high emitting facilities. Thank you so much. Um, I've, I'm from the finance sector and uh, the one question I have is on the translation of some of the things that we've seen on carbon as a metric moving into methane. We've seen, yeah. I saw the, the WBCSD manifesto launch this week said that methane is a top priority for corporates in terms of tackling emissions reductions, but also disclosures of methane. And I wondered how do you think the finance sector should really be looking at one, the, um, the metrics on methane, and two, how the disclosure frameworks will develop, because we see a lot of innovation in sustainable finance to tackle decarbonization, but the kind of demethanization, I don't even know if that's a word, <laughs> um, but I wonder how do you see that progressing and what should the industry really be looking at to ensure that we have material transition on methane that's using sustainable finance innovation mm. in the correct way? Do you want to begin or do you want you me to? You go ahead and I'll add. I think that this is, I think this is a really important question and I think that what is critical is to recognize that methane, methane emissions are, as we noted, much higher on a 20 year time frame and starting to measure methane, methane emissions on that 20 year time frame is critical because we are dealing with vanishing, vanishing amounts of time. Um, we are racing against the clock. But what I don't want to see industry, what I don't want to see the financial sector doing is saying, all right, well, we're reducing methane emissions over here so we can slow, slow reductions in CO2 over here. It is, this, is a, this is a moment where we need to be cutting all of our emissions as quickly as we can. Um, Cutting, cutting, um, cutting methane is important, not only, not only because of the temporal impact of the methane, but because, you know, frankly, we don't have 100 years to wait for real action. Yeah, I mean, what I would add is just in the same way that we were urging the financial sector to be aligning its investments so that it is, on, it is contributing to a 1.5 degree pathway, there's no reason that shouldn't include uh, methane as part of that, given given its potency, especially over the short term, and given how you know, relatively inexpensive uh, abating methane is, because it's very potent, because capturing some of it means, means um, there's, there's a revenue source there. And so um, you know, even at the low end, there's even gains to be made financially. And of course, you can get quite substantial emission reductions at low cost. And so, um, that should be part of the analysis when, when um, both public and private 
um, finance institutions are looking at their investments and, and, tr and getting them in line with, with a pathway that, that avoids going beyond that 1.5 degree threshold. I don't know if there are any other questions in the room. If not, I don't know if you had any last thoughts, Carol, or you Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I think I'd like to just sum up in, in a place very like where we began. I think we're in a moment where what we need to be looking for is where can we cut quickest across the board? Um, absolutely, you know, beginning, you know, the a target of cutting 30% of methane emissions globally by 2030 is a beginning, but it is that, only a beginning. Yeah. Um, what we will find, however, is as we look at the root causes of the climate crisis and begin to address those root causes, the solutions become clearer, they become simpler, and they become more effective. And ultimately, the, the fastest way to address the climate crisis and address meth the methane emissions that are driving the climate crisis um, is to stop producing fossil fuels. Great. We'll leave it at that.